Our guest this week is Martin Bell, Senior Analyst on Middle East Affairs. With Martin we'll discuss ISIS, we'll discuss Russia and we'll discuss religion. Well, uh, welcome back to the English Hour on ANN Television. Our guest today is Martin Bell. He's an analyst, indeed a senior analyst at the Next Century Foundation. He's lived and in much of his youth, spent much of his youth in the Middle East. Uh, he's a good friend and it's an honor to have him with us. Martin, we'll be talking today about Russia. We'll be talking about ISIS, a key issue for all of us. Daesh, the Arab world calls them. And we'll be talking about religion, another major issue in the world today. Um, before we do, we're going to just have a short clip and then we we'll go straight into our discussion. So, Martin, welcome. <laughs> ISIS is a movement that has now seen large-scale intervention from the West with the widespread air attacks and drone attacks on suspected ISIS targets by the US and its coalition of the willing Mark II. These have so far yielded very little in the way of curbing ISIS's expansion in the area. This has a great deal to do with the support that ISIS are getting from within the region and the monetary support from key players in the region, even if that is not acknowledged publicly. However, with the more grisly realities of ISIS's plan for its expansion coming to light, could we see the tide turn for this Takfiri group who murdered its most high-profile Muslim captive, Peter Kassig, also known as Abdul Rahman? It is important to note, of course, that the vast majority of ISIS's victims have been fellow Muslims but those victims are counted casualties of war. The role of the United States in the Middle East is of enormous importance. Perhaps we are less familiar with the role of Russia. Both have interests in the region. Nonetheless, Russia is playing a very important role now both directly and through its support for Iran, one of the biggest power bases in the Middle East. Russia has recently announced that it wants to push for a Russia-mediated peace deal between the Assad government and the rebels, a Moscow one, if you will. But does Russia have the political clout and legitimacy with regional actors to be able to bring both sides together? And what does a burgeoning role in relation to its tacit or otherwise support for Assad in Syria mean for its proposed peace deal and the success of De Mistura's freeze plan. Finally, we come to religion and an age-old question of whether it's a force for good or evil. Looking around the world today, we see a large number of acts committed in the name of religion, particularly in the Middle East. Muslim religious leaders have been somewhat slow to condemn absolutely the actions of ISIS. Though this has changed somewhat after the spate of beheadings that have rendered ISIS indefensible to all but the staunchly Salafist. Is the world becoming subject to an all-pervasive climate of extremism? Thank you for being our guest on ANN. Um, we do want to talk about well, we've got so much to talk about, but let's start with the, 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 at the tough end. Let's start with ISIS, with Daesh, with the Islamic State, whatever you like to call them. Um, what's your take on the way things are at the moment? Well, to summarize, I think they've extend, overextended themselves. If you look on the map, and I'm a surveyor, and it's the first thing I look at always is a map, is the enormous geographical separation of their different fronts. Mm. Um, they are fighting up on the Turkish border uh, at Kobani, mm. um, based out of their so-called capital, Raqqa. In Syria, they are fighting um, 
uh, to the north of Baghdad and the west of, the ba of Baghdad, uh, between Fallujah and Baghdad, and they're also uh, confronting the Iraqi Kurds to the east of uh, Mosul. Now, for any army, that is a huge logistic problem. If you add to that the fact that whenever they try and move, the Americans are up there bombing them, you can understand why they've been reduced to trying to resupply their force in Kobani with motorcyclists. Mm. Uh, and the reason for that is that they can't supply with um, technicals, Toyota pickups, mm. because the Americans are just knocking them out. So they have got a, a major logistic problem. And um, coupled with the fact that the Syrian army, the regime army, um, has had some quite considerable recent successes, uh, one of them uh, against uh, Daesh, uh, the um, al Shah uh, gas fields uh, to the east of Homs, um, and the hills overlooking it where they were driven out. Uh, I'm not sure things are going all their, their own way. Uh, in fact, it's very interesting that a, uh, there was a posting on, um, on the internet by one of their uh, spiritual leaders um, explaining to their young fighters that the, the death of young, inexperienced soldiers, um, the blood was, was being spent to pave the way for other soldiers to come behind them. Uh, they've been taking quite considerable casualties, mm. uh, particularly in Kobani. It's become a meat grinder up there. Well, let's talk about Kobani a moment. I mean, that's an interesting... Because they are fighting on so many fronts, mm. so they are not a weak force in the sense that they are able to, to, to drive on and, and b fight on this vast range of fronts. The, in Kobani, um, they are majorly supported by the Turks, no? I mean, they, the Turks are backing them up uh, in, this, in so much as they are not letting... They're letting refugees flee from Kobani, but not letting fighters come into Kobani from uh, other Kurdish fighters to support the, the people in there. Well, they have done. Uh, there's been quite a change in uh, policy by, by the Turkish government. Um, they have uh, allowed, as you're probably aware, uh, a force of, um, of Kurdish of Turkish, uh, sorry, Iraqi Kurds, Peshmerga fighters, mm. to cross over into Kobani from Turkey. They have also um, assisted 350 uh, FSA, Free Syrian Army, fighters uh, to go in uh, to fight with the Syrian and Iraqi Kurds. So... Um, it's very patchy. I mean, the, 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 the desire is to give real support to the people in Kobani, but the Turks, I mean, the Turks have been buying ISIS oil. The Turks, uh, all, the, all the fighters that come into to Syria go through Istanbul. I mean, the 3,000 Libyans or the however many hundred Brits. And the Turks facilitate in the sense that they, they, uh, they go down, they travel through Turkey. The Turks are well aware of it. Um, they're not exactly... Well, that, that has happened in the past. I'm not sure that that is happening now. Uh, because, um, uh, unbelievably, and I still don't understand why they did it, but when uh, Daesh um, captured Mosul, they uh, took the Turkish consulate staff sure. hostage, uh, which infuriated the Turks. But also, the, the fact of the matter is that um, all those countries that had quietly supported uh, Daesh uh, in the past, have suddenly realised it's turned into a, a bit of a monster. Um, certainly, it's not. Uh, it's, it's it's got a mind of its own now, and it's not necessarily the mind that its former patrons wanted it to have. Mm. So um, the Americans have put a considerable amount of pressure on um, on Turkey to uh, join the coalition. Uh, the Turks. Uh, want to see something in return. They want a no-fly zone, um, a, a buffer zone along the Turkish border mm. where refugees can go without being bombed by the 
Syrian Air Force, uh, and they want uh, a lot more support, considerable support, for what are classed as the moderate fighters. Now, they're not going to get that, are they, in the present climate? I mean, the, the, uh, the Turks have been the bad boys. Um, uh, they have really been um, out on a limb, I mean, I, in my view. But, but whatever, they're not going to... You're not going to now um, have a situation where America makes things more difficult for Syrian forces, uh, Syrian government forces. They're even coordinating now airstrikes. I mean, when they're striking um, ISIS targets, the Americans go in uh, immediately after the Syrian Air Force coordinated together. I mean, they, they, they I don't know whether th that actually is happening. Remember that the Americans know exactly what's going on in Syria. Uh, they and, and the British Royal Air Force have highly sophisticated aircraft called mm -hmm. rivet joints uh, flying over Syria now, uh, scooping up a huge amount of uh, electronic and image intelligence. So if, um, if the Syrian army attacks an ISIS position, they don't need to be told by the Syrians what's going on. They're up there and they know. Mm. Um, I think politically uh, it would be exceedingly difficult if the Americans, it were, if it could be shown that the Americans were actually coordinating with uh, the Syrian armed forces. Um, obviously the Syrian armed forces are not um, not stopping the Americans, they're not threatening them in any way, they're not sending jets up to challenge their presence over Syrian airspace. Mm. But I don't think it extends to, or from what I've heard, I don't think it extends to actual coordination and cooperation. Mm. I'm not sure, uh, well, you may be right, but um, regardless of that, ISIS is a major force. ISIS has an agenda, and ISIS has made its agenda very clear. I mean, they um, they are saying, and, and saying publicly, that their, their next major target is Mecca and Medina. Um, and whether you regard that as a joke or whether you regard it as serious, there is a lot of support uh, in, in the Sunni world for ISIS. Um, their, their agenda, according to some of their sympathizers, is, is uh, to pretty much ignore Jordan, Lower Iraq and the rest and go for Mecca and Medina and then on to uh, North Africa, Libya and Algeria and so forth. Um, the, they're, they're a pretty serious outfit because we can't seem to destroy them. I mean. Well, where they have, um, their, their tactics uh, have been superb. They, they use, um, they use uh, uh, pickup trucks mm. uh, like cavalry mm. and they move very, very, very fast uh, highly mobile and they focus their attacks and they concentrate their forces but that's that is okay until they hit an immovable object like for instance the Peshmerga in um, in Iraq Kurdistan mm. uh, and the moment that happens they then become very vulnerable to air attack now there's a lot of talk about the in so-called ineffectiveness of, uh, of coalition airstrikes. I doubt that very much, because you can see that uh, Daesh, ISIS, is, change, is trying, having to change its tactics because of the way in which it's being attacked by coalition aircraft. Remember, some, go on, yes. remember that you know, we hear a lot about, and the most recent person to say it was the Saudi foreign minister who said, there has to be boots on the ground. Everyone's saying there has to be boots on the ground. Mm. They should look at their history and the history of Iraq and go back to the 1920s where there was a revolt against the British mm. and a debate took place in Whitehall about how it was to be dealt with. And the British Air Force, the Royal Air Force, said, well, we can deal with this. You don't need boots on the ground. It's much, much cheaper to let us deal with it. And that's precisely what happened. And the man who led that bombing campaign against rebellious tribes was a man known as Bomber Harris, Sir Arthur Harris, who was the leader of Bomber Command during World War II. But that was the first time that uh, an air force was used to, if you like, suppress revolt. Mm. 
No, it was rather more brutal. I mean, there, there was the first time also in history that chemical weapons were used That's by, very the, by true. the British. I'm not suggesting that what the British did was particularly noble, mm. but the fact of the matter is you can, um, you, can, uh, you can inflict a lot of punishment on an enemy from where, where you are unopposed in the air. Well, it is true, but I mean, is it, is it counterproductive? We look at uh, the area south of Iraq, uh, south of Baghdad, that's been liberated recently from uh, Daesh, and it's been done, the, the air campaign has virtually obliterated everything on the ground, and if that's liberation, uh, you, you will end up with more sympathy from the, from the Sunnis for ISIS. Is this, uh, is, is it alleged that this is American uh, bombing? Or is well, it, uh, I mean, I mean, that's the thing, isn't it? You can't tell. The, um, just, I mean, before the, 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 the general new campaign against ISIS, there was um, a barrel bombing of the hospital in Fallujah. Uh, do you, uh, if you're on the ground and you're being hit, do you know whether it's American or, or Iraq no. Air Force or well, what? You, you don't. A bar well, a barrel bomb is a very cheap way of chucking a bomb out of a helicopter. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and which, of course, has happened a lot in Syria. Uh, you're talking there about Iraqi, uh, Iraqi forces. The Iraqis don't or don't have fast jets. Mm. Any fast jet that's flying over Iraq um, is, Syri is uh, Iranian. Mm. Um, or Russian piloted. Or Russian piloted. Sukhoi. Yes, yes. Uh, okay. But the Russians have got very sophisticated. Um, uh, targeting instruments, mm. um, the Iranians less so. Uh, but uh, I haven't heard. Um, obviously, if if um, if uh, ISIS positions are being bombed, there is going to be some uh, collateral damage, as they mm. say. But it's not something that has actually surfaced as a um, as a major problem in Iraq at the moment. Yeah, yeah well, I'm not sure that's true. But if it is true. We have the underlying grievances, which certainly are the grievances by the, from the, uh, amongst the Sunni tribes, which they, they feel acutely about the uh, issue of the debarthification laws is the classic one, but there are many. Ah, well now you're, yes, but I think everyone now agrees that that, that was uh, a dreadful uh, mistake. Yeah, but we haven't changed, we're not changing it. Well, it needs to be changed. Mm. It needs to be changed because uh, somehow or other the Iraqi government and this was a point made by um, the um, made by the um, uh, the new um, prime minister of Iraq, and also by the uh, uh, Saudi Arabian foreign minister, that the, the government in Iraq must be more inclusive. It must involve the Sunnis far more than it was under the uh, regime of Nouri al Maliki, which was a disaster. Mm. It was a disaster. Clearly. Um, and hopefully that's one of the things that will be happening in, in the forthcoming months. But at the moment, right now, there's, uh, there's a problem of how do you deal with Daesh, uh, East ISIS. Mm. Um, there has to be a deal with the Sunni tribes. Mm. Um, it's not just money. Uh, there has to be, in my opinion, and I've, I've seen it written about considerably, in policy papers, there has to be the same sort of devolved government in Sunni areas that was granted to the Kurds. Mm. There's no reason why uh, the Sunnis cannot be self-policing as long as the state of Iraq is recognized. So Iraq becomes a confederal state, as the Kurds would wish. A why not? Confederation. Why not? Yeah, uh, I'd, I'd agree with you, but um, whether the central government in Baghdad uh, would go that far, but it's interesting. Um, well, we they, they they have no choice. Mm. Let's be realistic. Um, Iraq has been devolved at the barrel of a gun, mm. by mm. the barrel of a gun. It has been somehow or other. It has to be held together by compromise, and one of those compromises has to be a significant amount of devolution to uh, mm. to the Sunni population, and the. Meanwhile, we have a new UN negotiator in Syria who's, um, who would like Geneva 3, but is going to have to cope with possibly with Moscow 1, uh, because that's the way it, the, 
the cookie crumbles. He's talking about a freeze, uh, another, another, a, a truce rather than a ceasefire, sure. in other words. Um, he's talking about beginning with Aleppo, having a, uh, a truce in Aleppo, uh, which somehow establishes the status quo, and then moving on from there. Um, and he is having to deal with a new reality where Russian, well, it's not a new reality, but it's a renewed reality where Russia is the key player with whom he has to deal. Um, Moscow 1 is coming up. You're talking about Russia. Russia is, is very powerful in the Middle East at the moment, wouldn't you say? It's a new resurgent Russia. Well, certainly it's more powerful than it was when Yeltsin was in power. Mm. Uh, the, the fact of the matter is that Syria has been, is a long-standing ally of Russia. And I think Russia is making a point uh, that it's, um, it's, st it's standing by its allies now. It saw what happened um, in Libya, uh, where uh, a United Nations Security Council resolution to allow the, um, a no-fly zone to protect the population of Benghazi was basically turned into regime change mm. and the death of um, Gaddafi. It still bitterly resents what happened to the dismemberment of, um, of Yugoslavia. Uh, and I think it's just making the point. It's not going to abandon the, uh, the Syrian government. Mm. And also there is another factor here, and it's the relationship between Russia and Iran. Iran is an important ally of Russia. And Iran, for many reasons, um, is d also equally determined to stick by uh, the Syrian government. And let's be quite honest, right now the Syrian government is, uh, is making progress. The, uh, um, the Sunni opposition, the rebels, are continuing to tear themselves apart and fight each other. Mm -hmm. um, why, should, why should the Syrian government make any concessions at all at the moment? Mm -hmm. um, and as long as the... Uh, as long as the Russian government continues to support the Syrian government um, materially and financially, uh, this could go on for ages. Mm. And so, yes, therefore, Moscow is in a very strong position. The Americans' policy towards Syria is a mess. Mm. Um, they, uh, in fact, President Obama admitted a couple of weeks ago is that he hadn't got a policy on Syria. Oh yes, this is the problem is again this not talking to them. I mean, it's this problem with Iran. Um, mm -hmm. They they are coordinating with Iran, but they can't say they're coordinating with Iran because um, if there were more inclusion of these key actors in the discussion, one could move much more quickly on on these issues. Um, that's the plus maybe of Moscow. One is that because in Moscow, if we're talking about peace talks taking place mm -hmm. in Moscow then Iran can be included because the host country will predicate the talks on that basis. Well, the, the Sunni opposition in Syria has been going to Moscow as well. The Russians are talking to, talking to them, they're talking to the Turks, um, they're certainly talking to the Iranians, um, and, and of course talking also to the United Nations. So you're referring to Moscow 1, the talking is already happening. Predominantly with the players. secular Sunni opposition. There is a difference. I mean, the, the West had been supporting a kind of uh, Muslim Brotherhood, uh, a quasi-Muslim Brotherhood yes. opposition. Um, and now the, uh, the people that are going to Damascus, uh, from, sorry, from Syria to, um, to Moscow tend to be a little more secular in flavor. Um, there is a different emphasis now with the Russians in the lead. Yes, they're, um, uh, the Russians, as you know, have a, 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 his a difficult history of, uh, of, um, of radical uh, Islamic mm. opposition, in Chechnya in particular. Mm. Mm. Uh, so if they're, going to, um, if they're going to help anybody, 
in the talks, it will be the um, it will be the secular opposition because mm. probably because they look at the um, uh, the so-called Islamist Islamist opposition and think that they are intractable mm. Mm. Uh, and that they won't compromise, uh, whereas the secular opposition will do. There's also an element of, I mean, we have we have kind of two major underlying wars in the Middle East. We have um, we have a war between Shiite and Sunni Islam that is up to a point being played out in places like Syria and Iraq. Then we have a kind of a war between um, Takfiri and the, 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 the extreme end of the Salafist movement, the Takfiris, mm -hmm. and the, the rest, um, and the Muslim Brotherhood, the Aqwan, um, at the moment are against the, uh, the Salafists, so-called, but in a way, the Muslim Brotherhood themselves are like uh, rebellious teenagers in a Salafist house. They belong to the, the, the... Essentially, they are Salafists, but they don't call themselves Salafists. So you have this sort of new neo-Salafist Muslim Brotherhood movement. You have the Salafists. They are head-to-head, -head, um, but ultimately... All of this inter-Muslim war that's going on will presumably crystallize into a war between those of, who are for ISIS, for the Takfiris, and those who are against. And it's, it, the, because the, it is the only real game in town, isn't it? It's the one, the one monster that has to be dealt with is, is ISIS. Yes, and I think we've got to be, uh, we shouldn't get carried away. A ISIS uh, made extraordinary gains. I, I, had a, I had a journalist comment to me that ISIS now controlled a territory larger than uh, Great Britain. Mm. And I said, well, yes, but most of it's sand. Um, that's not entirely true. Um, if you look at the map, mm. uh, they have taken uh, the, uh, the Euphrates Valley, they've attempted to take and have failed to take uh, the oil fields, they've been driven out, uh, driven away from the um, a refinery to the north of Baghdad at Baiji. Uh, they, they are, I, I go back to the point I made earlier, I think they're overstretched. Unless they get a large influx of foreign volunteers to boost their fighting force and a large amount of money because they've lost their they've lost most of their income from the sale of oil uh, to, to Turkey the yes. because the um, Americans just came in and and hit every one of their refineries yeah, not yeah. even with big bombs they just went in bang 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 knocked out key key equipment yeah. in each refinery so because it didn't work anymore. Because they bring Turkey on board to stop buying the stuff. Okay, yeah, well, I mean bear in mind that a lot of the smuggling was taking place in areas where the Turks really didn't uh, have total control. I'm not so sure. There, there's a vast columns of truck. To, to shift $800 million worth of oil, that's a lot of oil. Okay, um, well, whatever the reason, the fact of the matter is the Americans have knocked it out and that trade has now stopped. Yeah. So, and if they repair the refineries, the Americans will knock it out again. So they can't rely on that income anymore. And it's very interesting, uh, uh, the Queen of Jordan uh, gave a speech some time ago, which I picked up, where she said that uh, ISIS was paying young Jordanians $1,000 a month to go and fight with ISIS. Well, ISIS fighters are well paid. Yes. They're well paid. Now that needs money. And if you look at um, some of the things that have been happening since the coalition was formed, there has been a clamp down on the transfer of money. There's no doubt about it. In fact, um, uh, Britain went, went to um, uh, publicly declare that it, the charity commissioners were going to start looking very carefully at uh, yeah, Muslim that's charities. That's compared to the sums that ISIS is raising through raising taxes, through uh, hostage money paid by the French and the Italians, through donations from the Gulf. I mean, ah, it is well, it's the donations from the Gulf. Yeah, but they they, can't really they have to get the money. Somehow, the money has to be transferred to them. That's so difficult. Uh, and you don't think that's going to stop, do you? No, I don't, because they have a system. 
It's a system in place in Syria and Iraq. It's been there for thousands of years by which you, um, and I, I know for a fact my own daughter has used it. It's a, it's a system. If you want money in Baghdad, you go and see a man in Doha or wherever. Mm -hmm. Uh, you give him the money, and then sure. the money appears in Baghdad. There is no, There's no, no transfer involved. There's it's no a electronic system of transfer. Trust. No, and um, the Pakistanis use it, and yeah. uh, Indians use it as well. Uh, expatriate populations around the world do it. Well, there's no way um, of controlling this. It's impossible. It's not an internet transaction. It's not a. It's not a. It's it's not controllable. It's an ancient form of okay uh, money okay. transfer. But it it's a it presumes that the person at the ISIS end of the deal um, isn't stuck in jail. Well, yeah. Okay, so there are ways of doing it. Um, but ISIS needs a lot of money because they pay their fighters a lot of money. And uh, a lot of these fighters are there because of, of the money, let's well, be honest. Uh, yes they, and they, no. they, they have, obviously they will say they're motivated by a religious belief and I think we have to respect that. But, you know, the money is a factor. It surely is. I mean, you're right, because uh, you're right, and I, I think you're right and you're wrong. They are hugely funded, and people will um, have, they have vast amounts of cash, but, and they do pay their fighters liberally. But, I mean, they're getting this money, uh, and uh, you, maybe you're right, maybe it'll, Maybe it'll dwindle, but it hasn't. I think it, I th well, certainly it has dwindled already from the halt in the sale of oil. Mm, yes, that's to true. To Turkey. That, that has stopped now. And there's, it will be incredibly difficult for them to recover that business. And not only that, but they've also lost the refined product. They've, they don't, they can't produce diesel. Mm, mm. And, and if you're an army that is highly mobile with fleets of vehicles, you need... You need diesel oil, and they've got a real problem there. So there's many things that are not going their way. And as I said, in, uh, in Syria, the uh, regime is pushing them back. But there's an underlying issue, the issue of religion in the Middle East. Is religion a force for good, or is it a cogent and real force for evil in today's world? Look at what's going on in the name of religion in the Middle East and elsewhere. Well, I think it's a force for good. I think it's a force for good. Um, the, the, what's going on in the Middle East has a lot to do with resistance against oppression um, and injustice uh, and a way of living that we wouldn't tolerate in the West. Mm. Uh, and religious leaders have, if you like, stepped to the fore um, perhaps radical leaders, uh, and uh, but this isn't recent, William. This has been going on for decades and decades. And if you go back to the um, creation of the uh, Society of the Muslim Brothers uh, and the creation of Hezbollah, uh, the Shia revolution in in the Iranian revolution in uh, and the um, involvement of the Shia clergy there. Uh, these have all been movements that have been directed against injustice and lack of dignity. So I don't see, I don't see this as, as, a, as a negative extremism. The way that it's actually panned out at the moment, of course, is this, um, this rivalry between mainstream Sunni uh, Islam and Shia Islam uh, is, um, is in, in a way tragic. But uh, I think that the two, if you like, the two, the two blocks, Iran on one side and Saudi Arabia and Egypt <coughs> on the other, yes. mm. are not going to let that get out of control, really. I don't see that happening. They're, if you like, these are proxy battles that have been taking place. Um, but I don't see this as turning into a major um, sectarian conflict in the way some people do. You know, the Saudi Arabians and, and the Iranians are talking to each other. Mm. Um, well, they've got a Khashoggi nipping backwards and forwards on on. No, there are the conversations, and, but know, um, uh, not as many as in most of us would like. Um, 
it's a very stilted conversation between the Saudis and the Iranians. Uh, I, yes, but we'll, we'll wait and see. I think both Iran and Saudi Arabia had a shock by the, uh, the, the emergence of ISIS, who on the one hand is virulently anti-Shia, regards them as heretics, apostates, and in the next breath is claiming it's marching on mm. uh, Medina and Mecca. Yeah. So yeah. suddenly you've got the Iranians and the Saudis both looking north at this, what has now become a com common enemy. Mm. Um, there's nothing like having somebody like ISIS around to get the Saudis and the Iranians talking to each other. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. So uh, I, I think things will... I was quite optimistic the last time I was on your program when I said that I thought saw things uh, improving. I still think that the, the way things are going in Syria uh, is quite interesting. A report, a secret report, was carried out by an NGO called uh, the Humanitarian Dialogue, a Geneva-based... Uh, we know it, piece. yes. You know them. Yeah, new, yeah. Yeah. Uh, government-funded. And this is headed up by a, a New Zealander who was... Yeah. Um, who was in Bosnia for the UN. Yes. He's a good guy. He's a very establishment organization mm. run by um, one or two governments. But anyway, sure. yes, Western governments. But HD has been talking to um, the Syrian government, it's been talking to Nusra Front, it's been talking to ISIS, and it's been talking to the FSA, and the Iranians and the Russians, and it's come up with a a proposal which I suspect is the is if you if you like the groundwork for M Moscow one. Yes, it's this freeze idea. Yeah. The idea of a freeze. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, which really means that the American government has come up because it is it's it's the tool of of two or three governments, isn't it? Two or three major governments. I mean, we know the organisation you're talking sure. of, um, and um, yes. So I guess. Uh, um, and it's very credible. Um, and it's very public about the fact that it's funded by these two or three governments. So it's not exactly covert in that. Um, no, but the, the fact of the matter is it's been talking to the players in yes. Syria. And it, it has said that uh, the way forward is devolved, devolved administration, starting off with a freeze around Aleppo. Yeah. And of course, Syria, the Syrian government is making... Uh, progress in Aleppo. Uh, the um, the uh, um, Sunni uh, factions uh, are still fighting each other mm, mm. and um, it's taken advantage of that. Mm. But anyway, you wanted to talk about uh, religion and uh, extremism. Uh, the truth of the matter is I don't see it as extremism. I see it as reflecting real concern amongst the the um, Islamic clergy of, of both um, main sects uh, about the uh, iniquities that are being suffered mm -hmm. in, in Gaza, Hamas, mm -hmm. um, in, uh, in Syria. Mm -hmm. um, the clergy, Muslim clergy are much more proactive Mm -hmm. um, not necessarily, because uh, amongst the Shias there is a tradition of, uh, of, almost of standing back from the uh, troubles of the world, um, being more aesthetic. Mm -hmm. But, um, uh, and I'd give as an example um, uh, Ayatollah Sistani in, in Iraq, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. who, who did get involved when, after ISIS had taken Mosul and was storming down the down the, the Tigris mm, yes. and heading for Baghdad, he finally opened up and said, it's okay to volunteer for the militia and fight these people. Yeah. But he'd, he'd stayed back and stayed out of it when perhaps some people might say he should have been more involved and used his undoubted influence to put pressure on the, um, on the government, the Iraqi government, to be more inclusive and not to um, and not to oppress well, the Sunnis. I'm glad to see his statements recently. We don't, we need the same level of engagement from um, 
from other religious leaders uh, in, the, in the Arab and Muslim world who need to come forward. They are slowly coming forward, but that not forcefully enough to, to, to speak out. Really. Well, the Grand Mufti of, um, of Saudi Arabia has, um, has uh, come out and condemned ISIS uh, for what it has done and the way it's treating people, particularly civilians. And um, I think that is a positive note, though I accept that it, it, his statement had reservations. He, he does justify the use of force uh, to resist oppression, um, and I don't think there's anything wrong in that. Uh, but uh, it's a positive, it's a positive force. Uh, I think that's force for good. I've already mentioned uh, Ayatollah Sistani. And then, of course, there's the supreme leader of uh, Iran, mm. who has a, a huge amount of influence on what is going on at the moment, who was partly instrumental in the removal of Nouri al-Maliki mm. as uh, prime minister of Iraq, um, who exerts far more influence on government than uh, his counterpart in Iraq does, mm. uh, Ayatollah Sistani. Um, is it a force for good? Probably at the moment, yes. Mm. Yes. Uh, if there's going to be any deal done on Syria that ends the civil war there, um, then Iran has to be part of that. Mm. It's unavoidable. It has to be part of it. Well, let's help religious leaders, like the and indeed like the Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia, uh, because we need more Sunnis to come forward, uh, but take this uh, strong role for moderation and, and against extremism. It would be encouraging. Um, Martin, thank you. Thank you very much for being our guest on ANN Television. You're a real star. We haven't quite finished because there's a little <laughs> end note to this discussion, but thank you, Martin. Okay. So Martin, you brought us this book um, to discuss, and, and it's an interesting one to bring to the attention of our listeners, Resistance, The Essence of the Islamist Revolution by Alistair Crook. Um, very, it's published by Pluto Press, and it's certainly a, available and in print. A fascinating book. I, 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 I'm, a, I'm familiar with it, and I'm familiar with the author. What makes you choose this particular book? Well, partly because I met him in your house here. <laughs> That's yes. one reason. Uh, he also has a, a, a fascinating background. Mm. Um, I think it's, it's common knowledge, and it's well written about in, in, in the press, that he um, was a career MI6 officer. Mm. Uh, he's Irish, Irish-born, uh, and uh, he joined MI6 in the 1970, I believe and was for many years the government's British government's unofficial link with the provisional IRA. Yes, yes indeed. So he, and he, so I was interested in what he had written partly because of that, uh, but also he is now um, the director of an organization called uh, Conflict Forum. Yes. That right. organizes, he's Beirut based, he's, he organizes um, seminars, tries to get people together. Um, he's, not, he's not the Israelis' favorite by any means, but um, he, has, uh, he has good links with Hezbollah and Hamas. And he, he starts off in his book going back to the origins of Islamic resistance and the, and the figures mm. who, who led that, going back to the 1930s. Uh, and onwards. It is quite a, for me, I'm not an academic, I'm a, I'm a technician, I'm a surveyor, a form of engineer, and um, this is a book that's written by an academic for academics. So um, when he uh, refers, for instance, to the Enlightenment and um, 
and uh, philosophers, my instinct is to get onto Google and put in enlightenment. Yes, yes. What was that? Yeah, oh, wow. I have that uh, Voltaire, I'd heard of him, you know. Yeah. So it, it, is, it is, for someone like myself, with mm. a technical background, rather wordy, um, but he's got, um, he's got this habit of suddenly inserting a paragraph that sort of explains it all, it pokes you in the eye, and sums it up in a few sentences, or the message he's trying to get across in a few sentences. Mm. Um, so, it's it's in a sense, it's quite hard work for me. I think somebody who has uh, an academic training would probably find it uh, a lot easier. Um, but at the same time, it's the kind of book that leads you on to wanting to read a lot of other books, right. which is right. which is always encouraging. Um, he is sympathetic to Shia Islam, to, um, he's obviously been influenced by um, some quite uh, influential people in um, ir the Iranian clergy uh, and also with um, uh, Hezbollah as well. Uh, but of course you read things in that book that you will not read in mm. mainstream yes, sure. uh, newspapers. Well, he's a, he's a very interesting man. I mean, he was, as you say, a prominent uh, intelligence officer, and one heard of him, his name mentioned in whispers. Um, and then he left the intelligence service, I think partly because he felt the intelligence service, or not just the British, but the world's intelligence services, were losing their way and serving the government of the day rather than the nation. Well, if you believe an article in a, a left-wing magazine, mm. San Francisco magazine, called Mother Jones, um, he was fired in 2003. Ah. Well, that uh, might be true, too. But <laughs> was he fired? Jump of course. Or push. Yeah. Because was he fired? Yeah. Because I, I, I remember reading an article um, about, um, about uh, Dick Philby, Kim Philby's yes. dad who, Philby of Arabia, who was MI6's liaison man with Ibn Saud. And, and he was uh, officially fired, but he was on the payroll for 10 years afterwards. Yeah. So, <laughs> so Don't say that, you'd make Alistair's life difficult. No. Uh, no, I think he's definitely independent now. And, uh, and a good man, a very good man, a man to be respected. His views are, very, are often very controversial, but it, they certainly need listening to. Uh, Alistair Crook, Resistance, the Essence of the Islamist Revolution, and um, we commend it to our listeners by Pluto Press. It's certainly an interesting book, certainly worth reading, and very insightful. Thank you for bringing it to us here. That's right. And it's thank you for being our guest on ANN Television. Many thanks. I Martin. enjoyed it. Thank, thank you. you.